we left off, it's funny, I was, I made the slide for Thursday, and then yesterday I was making the slide for this, and I just noticed the last slide that I had already made for Thursday uh, is also the first slide that I made for today. Uh, it's the same verse from Exodus 15. So, I guess this is where we're starting, because this is what I picked both times. Um, God gives these commands frequently, where he is talking to the people as a whole and telling them, you need to listen to me, and it will go well with you. Uh, I mean, here, it's kind of a promise and also kind of a threat. If you diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, this is God speaking to the people, and do that which is right in his eyes, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I, this is a threat, Right? I won't disease and plague you the way that I diseased and plagued Egypt, right? Sometimes it's a promise of land flowing with milk and honey and descendants more than numbers and everything else, if you listen to the voice of God. Here it's a threat. You better listen, or you just saw what I can do, and that's what I do to people who don't listen, right? Who have hard hearts. Um, it seems like the hard-heartedness of Pharaoh is also a key attribute in Israel moving forward. Um, I think we normally say things like stiff-necked, a mm -hmm. stiff-necked people. Yeah. I imagine it's the same sort of turn of phrase, right? Where it's reflecting their inability to be changed by God, whether it's a hard heart or a stiff neck or however, whatever bodily, you know, euphemism they're using. But this is constantly God's discussion and it's not going to get any better for the rest of this class, right? I mean, this is always going to be the issue moving forward. So we, we're just going to have to kind of examine stuff, and we're going to see, oh, this is the same thing that happened before, so we might skip over some stuff for the sake of time. And I don't want to say boredom, but we read the same thing. It happened, and now it's happening again. So we can just say, oh, this is happening again, and move on. So that is my plan, at least. I divided this section into three kind of main ideas. Looking at God providing for the people, looking at what's actually happening on Sinai, and then looking at the tabernacle. So, looking at provision, we have these three different kind of stories where the people start grumbling, and God is intervening to help. So the first one is actually before the passage that we just read. Uh, they make it out of Israel. They go three days into the wilderness and they don't find any water. This is a problem for how many people do we think it is? Like a million people and they don't have any water. It's a problem. They come They come to Mara, which means bitter, right? Um, I think this pops up a lot, that Mara means bitter, Old and New Testament. Um, I'm not, I'm not familiar exactly what, mar, what bitter water means. I imagine it's salt water or otherwise um, foul water, right? They can't drink it. And so they complain because they can't drink the only water that they have found in three days. And so they bring this grumble against Moses. Uh, and this is constantly the issue. They complain to Moses. Moses complains to God. And then God gets mad at either Moses or the Israelites. Right? It kind of happens over and over. Uh, he cries to the Lord. The Lord shows him a log. He throws the log into the water, and the water becomes sweet, meaning potable, drinkable, maybe not salt water anymore. We don't really know. We also have no idea, like, people try to figure out, oh, it was this was the issue with the water. It had this chemical in it, and therefore it was undrinkable, and the log had this chemical in it, and it counteracted the chemical in the water and made the Bible's not interested in any of that, any of our, like, trying to figure out the chemistry behind what Moses is doing, throwing this log into the water. Not interested. This is, uh, the story is clearly designed to show that God is the one providing the water. There's something wrong with it, God fixed the problem through Moses. So, um, we continue to see these sorts of issues. They come to another place, they find lots of water, lots of palm trees, it seems like some sort of, you know, oasis. Um, then we have another issue. They have found water, but then they move on. 
and now in 16 they don't have any food and so now the complaint is it, the complaint is lying on both ends I think our book talks about this a lot of they're making up a better situation that they had in Egypt than they actually had they're talking about like pots of meat that they used to sit next to and bread for the to the full and that is not the case that we saw when we were reading the story 10 chapters ago so they are um, I, there's a song that my wife listens to painting pictures of Egypt right they're they're imagining things better than they really were I think we all kind of do that like you're in an unhealthy relationship you get out of it for a year and then you look back and you think of like the good times right um, this is kind of what they're doing they're abused and, and tortured and enslaved and they're looking back fondly on it because they're hungry um, so God intervenes again uh, because now they have this conspiracy theory. God should have just killed us in Egypt by his own hand because he brought us out here just to starve us to death. Right? Which is nonsense. So what does God do here? I think this is probably the more famous. He gives the man. The man, right. Um, why is it called man? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the Hebrew word for what is it, because they don't know what it is, right? Um, I think it's like the Hebrew for what is it is like manhu or something. Um, and so they call it that because they don't know what it is. We also have no idea what it is. It's like a weird flaky pasty something or other that's on the grass, and they just kind of pick it up and put it in jars. And they get a lot of it. It's like four liters each for every person in Israel. I mean, four liters is... I, mean, I guess the only way we think of it is like two liters of soda, right? So they get four liters of this like flour paste stuff. And I guess they can cook with it. Sometimes they boil it, sometimes they bake it. We don't really know. It describes it as white as coriander seed and tasting like honey wafers. Um, this is in 1631. The taste of it was like wafers made with honey, which sounds nice, right? Eventually, they complain about it because they're bored, right? They get this miraculous food that tastes good, but they eat it every day and they're tired of it. Right now, they're okay with it. But the Lord uses these and describes them, uh, these different provisions as tests. So in 1525, uh, before we get this, um, you know, you have to listen to the word of the Lord. He says, the Lord made for them a statute and a rule and there he tested them. We continue to see in these types of provision that he provides that the Lord tests the people. So with the manna, the test is, are you going to continue to keep the Sabbath even while I'm providing the food for you daily? Right? And so God gives them the rules. You collect one day's worth of food and don't collect more. This is very much like what Jesus teaches, you know, the, the Lord's Prayer. Give us today our daily bread. Right? Tomorrow we'll worry about tomorrow. Today is what we need. That is reflective of this reality. That God is providing daily bread for his people. So he tells them, don't keep any extra. And then what do some of the people do? They are experimenting. They keep extra. And it turns bad. Right? It's filled with maggots. Gross. But God tells them on the day before Sabbath, so this would be Friday, collect twice as much. So eight liters of stuff for each person. And they do that, and what happens on the Sabbath? It's fine. It doesn't go bad. Mm -hmm. Even though any other day that they kept extra, it would go bad. So the God, so God is miraculously providing both the daily and the way to keep Sabbath. And people are ignoring both of those. Because there are people who still go out and try to find some on the Sabbath. And that makes God angry, because he told them not to do that. Right? Um, we will start to see, and I think uh, we'll get to it in a second... There are times when God interacts with Moses, Moses tells the people stuff, and the people just kind of do what they're told. There are other times when Moses comes and tells them things, and the people respond, and the text tells us, all of the people respond with one voice, we agree to what you're saying, right? That is important, because that is when all of the people agree to the covenant. They're agreeing to the rules. So when an individual breaks the rules, they can't say they didn't know. Here, it seems like maybe they're not trusting Moses. 
or they didn't catch the rules, right? You can imagine if there's a million people and Moses is giving out a rule, Joe down the street, who's you know 100,000 people away, didn't hear, oh, you're not supposed to go out on Sabbath. So he goes out on Sabbath, there's nothing there, whoops, right? It doesn't sound as like sinful. Later it gets into all of the people in one voice agree to what Moses was telling them. Moses is laying down the conditions of covenant. God is going to do this and we're going to do this. And all of the people agree so that when one of them goes off track, they're held accountable because they've agreed to it. Um, there's debate about, like, could all of the people, a million people, have heard all of the rules? And did they all, with one voice, really say the same thing at the same time? I think it's a, a representative, right? The text is telling us all of the people were on board as a group, as Israel, they're agreeing to this. Does that make sense as a distinction? Um, <clears throat> any questions on manna? Um, go ahead. I saw a hyperlink here, like a fast track that says here in 16.4, they draw the comparison of Moses. Uh, it says, in response to the request for manna, like shortly after he fed 5,000, Jesus makes the same point about himself and says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Yeah. So I think that's in John, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we can continue to look at those sorts of things of Jesus will identify himself with these sort of very physical things in the Old Testament that we don't really see. I mean, there are some things where we're like, oh, this is God doing something. The angel of the Lord coming down as a pillar of fire. Oh, maybe that's Jesus, right? Easy enough to figure out. But there are other times when Jesus says, no, do you remember when, she, when Moses struck the rock and water came out of it? That was also me, right? And I, and I think that is more metaphorical than it is that Jesus inhabited that rock somehow and, like, forced water out of it with magic. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's saying metaphorically, do you remember when God gave us food every day? Well, now he's giving you me every day, and you can have interactions with me on a daily basis. Um, I don't think he's saying that, like, the second person in the Trinity is present, and he's the one that's like scattering the manna around the fields for them to collect. If that makes sense as a as a distinction, but yes, um, Jesus and his disciples pick up on a lot of these very physical things and say, "Oh, that might have been telling us something about Jesus," or that might be a way that we can interpret the things that we're seeing about Jesus, even if here in reality, Christ is not the person who's actually doing the thing. Right? He's not the person who's present in the rock or the manna or the quail or whatever. But they're using those things as metaphors of, this is a way that we can understand the reality of Jesus. Is that? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. I was, I was looking at more of the, the fact that, and I'm trying to find it because it's down here in the footnotes of 16.4, but it talks about the number 5,000, where it says that uh, Moses makes a point in the next generation that uh, he has fed 5,000. Hmm. You're saying that they say that in Exodus? No, it says, I'm trying to find it. I don't think I remember seeing a number. Oh, no, Deuteronomy 3. It's, it's quoting, at, I'm looking at the ESV study Bible down the bottom. It says 16.4, but then it jumps forward to Deuteronomy 8.3, and it says, Moses makes his point clear to the next generation in response to the request for manna for a manna-like sign shortly after he has fed 5,000. Hmm. And I'm wondering if that has anything to do with Jesus feeding 5,000. Yeah, I don't, see, I don't see the number of 5,000 in the Old Testament. I think that just might be the commentators of our text knowing what Jesus does and relating the two stories. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything here, because Moses isn't attributed with feeding them, and the number is way more than 5,000. Yeah. Right here, it's hundreds yeah, of thousands. Yeah. That's um, why I was wondering why. So that seems more like just the commentator is making a note that seems a little... Mm -hmm. Like he's in, he's inputting the number that not that is not... How do I say it? It doesn't have anything to do with what we're reading, right? It's just from Jesus' story. Yeah, it doesn't say it. Yeah. It says, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man right. does not live by bread alone. Right. The manna is a big deal for the Israelites. I think we talked about this on Thursday. They put manna in the ark. 
they don't put anything in there, right? They put the wall, they put the mana, and they put Aaron's um, staff that bugs, right? There are other things they could have put, and they choose not to. The mana is a big deal, right? They talk about it a lot. And so when Jesus is coming in and saying, I'm the bread from heaven, we think that the like collective psyche of Israel knows how important the manna was because they collected enough of it and it was miraculously preserved, right? It didn't get maggots in it, in the ark forever. Um, and they could have done that with a lot of stuff, right? And they chose the manna to be the representation. I mean, they could have gotten like the miraculously cured water that's now sweet and put a jar of water in there. Remember that time that God had bitter water and made it good for us. Hey, do you guys remember that time that Moses hit this rock and water came out of it? That was pretty cool. Let's get a jar of that water and put it in here and label it rock water, right? And we'll put that in there. And they don't do that with anything else. It's the manna that's the big thing. Um, I guess we'll get to that. That's the next story is the It's absolutely the water. terrifying in light of the fall that they didn't reach a point of asking Moses, like, hey, would God help us with yeah. I yeah. mean, they're so stuck in that's yeah. Which is fascinating and, because in not figuring out You could imagine that that would be easy to do if they didn't see like the pillar of fire and the clouds coming down all the time. Right. Or see the storm and hear the voice of thunder on the mountain. Right? So if we're led by someone who tells us that they're divine that they have these interactions with the divine and they're telling us these rules it would make sense for us to kind of grumble against that person sometimes hey things aren't going well maybe they're not really hearing the voice of god but if we see the stuff that god is doing interacting with moses it seems a lot harder for us to say hey you're not doing right by us or hey would you just go ask him if he could bring us some i mean like hey, right. so he brought us water can he can he help us with this right you know right and that we don't see that that happens I wonder if that does happen sometimes, but because the author is telling us a specific story, we don't get those parts of the story. We get the grumbling parts of the story because that's kind of the point, is that God is the one doing all these things and God is the one dragging Israel along. Israel hasn't done anything to earn the stuff that they're getting, right? Israel is completely a beneficiary of the promises God makes to Abraham. And it seems like God makes the promises to Abraham unilaterally. God shows up to Abraham and makes promises to him, regardless of what Abraham thinks or believes, right? And God, because he's made those promises based on his own word, based on his own character, he keeps them. And so Israel is along for the ride. And the constant pushback shows God didn't pick Israel because they were good and they were going to be faithful and they were the best people to choose. This is what he says in Deuteronomy. is like, I didn't choose you because you were the best people or because you were the most numerous. I chose you because I love you, and I love you because I chose you. It's all about me. It doesn't have anything to do with you. You, you are completely the beneficiary of my choice, right? And I, maybe that's what the author is trying to convey, is if we continually had people that are doing the right thing, like Joshua, mm -hmm. um, if those people are always around saying, hey, we should go and ask God for this. Hey, we should be faithful. Hey, we shouldn't be building this golden calf then that might undermine that idea that God is the one who's doing everything. And if it's constantly the people are always at odds with God, or they're always not on board with the plan, maybe that conveys the point better? I'm not sure. Um, I mean, you see Joshua floating around in the background in Exodus, yeah. and he's always doing the right thing. So you'd imagine if the author wanted it to be, hey, there's these really good people leading Israel, and they're always doing the right then they would focus on those stories and not tell us about the grumbling and uh, the next story is the the rock water. Again, the people are thirsting. Again, they are, um, I guess exaggerating isn't the right word, because they are thirsty. But they, it's like the, when Peter's walking out of the water, and then he looks down, and then like, he, no, it's not, it's uh, when they're on the boat, and the boat is really rocky, and they come and wake up Jesus, and they say, don't you care at all, we're drowning? You're actually completely safe. Everything is fine. Jesus knows that, and you guys are the ones that are freaking out over nothing. So it could be something like that. 
They say, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Calm down. Right? Um, so what happens here? The Lord says to Moses, pass on before the people, take with you some of the elders, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders. He called the name of the place Masa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people and uh, them asking, is the Lord among us or not? I'm, I'm interested in this story principally because it seems like God tells him to go and do this outside of the sight of the people. Right? Go, by, go ahead of the Israelites. Bring some elders with you to testify to what you did. But not everybody needs to see this. Right? It seems a little odd compared to Moses doing other stuff that's very much in front of everybody. Right? I'm going to go up to the mountain and you guys are going to see some stuff. And you guys aren't allowed to touch the mountain or you'll die. Right? But they're all aware and watching what's happening. Everybody in Israel can see the cloud coming down to the tent of meeting and Moses goes inside. They all know what's going on. Here it seems like Moses is going ahead and doing something private or, I don't know. I'm not sure what to make of it. Does anybody have any thoughts? Does this bother anybody else? It, I find it very interesting <laughs> that it's go ahead of Israel and they're not going to see what you do. Maybe this is, isn't there another instance where Moses does this and he gets in trouble? For striking that, the rock? That's what I was thinking, because I think in a different instance, God says, speak to the rock, and like water's going to come out, and Moses mm -hmm. strikes it. Right. I think I've read things that are like, <coughs> the Lord told Moses to strike it before, so maybe Moses was like, if I strike it, or like, I don't know, some weird conjecture, but I don't know. Um, let's see. Because he gets in trouble for it, because he yeah, strikes it. Yeah, it's the Numbers rock. 20, the next time it happens. And I'm wondering if the people seeing it is part of the issue. Uh, take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. And you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded them. They gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said, blah, blah, blah. He lifted up his hand and he struck the rock, and the water came out. Uh, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you didn't believe me to uphold, my, to uphold me as holy, you shall not bring this assembly into the land. So this is, I mean, this is the big thing that Moses does that gets him, so he can't be the one to bring them into Canaan. So, and this is, I'm just thinking off the cuff. Um, I wonder if part of the issue is the Israelites seeing him do it, right? Because here he strikes the rock privately. They don't, the, the people don't see him do it. And later, God tells him to assemble everybody and watch, but don't hit the rock. Tell it to come out. And then he does hit it in front of everybody. Maybe that's the issue? Maybe the, the seeing him do the thing? I mean, there's got to be something going on in Moses' heart. Right. To say, you know, oh yeah, it's me, you know. There's got and to and be that a, might be what it is, a, is that... By striking it himself, he can get credit for bringing yeah, out the water. Exactly. Yeah. So God is telling him to do it, but don't let everybody else see because I don't want people to think you're doing it. Yeah. Right? And then the next time when God says, speak to the rock and water will come out, that might be more miraculous, even though mm -hmm. that yeah. still seems like Moses would be the one doing it. But then he hits it, which may make it seem like, so, look how cool well, I am. I can do this. In the past as opposed to trusting God today. Yeah. You know. Go ahead. It, uh, in this one here, it says, The command, you shall strike the rock, is thus understood to be God's command to Moses to strike God himself. With the result that God himself is the source of the life-giving water that flowed from the rock, this incidentally probably provides the background in the New Testament when Paul says the rock was Christ. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're... No. no. I don't know. Because it's also he's also connecting this to... The Nile, where he takes the staff and strikes the Nile and turns it into blood, right? And so the same staff, the same striking, turns water into blood and turns rocks into water, which I think is what we're supposed to get out of it, is that God is doing weird stuff with, like, the laws of physics, right? There's, there's weird things going on. Maybe it's that the congregation is not supposed to see Moses is the one doing it. 
Maybe they're supposed to keep thinking that God is providing for them. And that's what happens here, but not in numbers. Maybe that's the issue. I don't know. I was struck by it. That's why because, I was bringing it up. Well, he says, like, the the elders of Israel see him strike the rock. So right. it's like, if I think elders, which I don't know, but if I personally think elders, I think people who are at least strong in their faith and, like, and have, like, knowledge. And know like, what's going on. Yes, and yes. know that, like, God is doing it. So Moses right. can strike the rock and everyone still knows, like, what's going on. But when right. you do it in the presence of Israel. Meanwhile, if a four-year-old is part of the congregation and they see that, Moses is the one who did it. Yeah. For sure. Exactly. Right? Um, so maybe that's part of the issue. And it's I like, don't know. if he struck a rock, then I can just, like, strike a rock and the water will come out of it. So yeah. maybe it's, like, also that kind of thing, like, trusting in your own. And there are a lot of it's supposed to be that generational shift that God knows is, is going to happen. So the four-year-old might be the most important witness later. Yeah. yeah. Would the elders be of the 12 tribes? I think the elders are. Because um, then, are there elders in this story to or go back to the tribe and tell them exactly what happened? So there's the whole story that comes in. There's the whole story in 18, where Jethro comes and tells Moses, "Hey, you're doing too much. You need to get helpers." And he picks elders mm -hmm. from. Um, I, is it 70? Is that just in my head? In um, uh, chapter 18. Saying. In my head, it's 70. I don't. I can't find the actual text that says that. Um, but it says, oh, no, it's, uh, yeah. Moses chose able men out of Israel and made them heads of the people, chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Mm -hmm. And they judged the people at all times. Uh, so I guess it's more than 70. Yeah. But I imagine the elders are these sort of people, well-known leaders within their local tribes. I bet it's more than 12, given the number, the total number of Israel. But it's probably limited. It's probably a limited number of people that are seeing this. And like we said, probably people who are very aware of God's intervention in Egypt and not, oh, Moses was the one doing the gnats and the frogs and the hail and stuff. Um, and so because they're very aware of God's intervention, they are on board with, oh, yeah, we can testify that Moses did it, but it was really God, right? But these people already exist before, right? Doesn't Moses, when he gets to Egypt to rescue the people, he meets with the elders, mm -hmm. right? So they, it's not something that God establishes elders. It's that they are, like, already the older leaders of the tribes. Well, and there were people think. coming to him during the plague. Like, quit. Yes. Yeah. Please don't do this. It's getting worse. So let's move forward because we are cruising through. Uh, Mount Sinai. We already talked about how this is the same place where God appears as the burning bush. And so God is calling his people back to this same place. So we're in 19. I did look that up, and it seems like the distinction between Horeb and Sinai might be that Sinai is simply limited to the mountain, and Horeb is the mountain and its kind the of region. Little surrounding area. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar enough. Uh, to I mean, know that's for just sure. what it said. Uh, you know, God knows. What yeah, because it's also talking about uh, in verse 1 here in 19. Three months after they left Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Mm -hmm. uh, they encamped in the wilderness of Sinai, and then they turned toward the mountain of Sinai. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's an issue of language. So they kind of said I'm not really sure. between the actual mountain and the mountain and its. So Moses went up to God at Sinai while Israel's encamped around the mountain. And the Lord calls to him out of the mountain and says, You shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did in e uh, to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you out to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Very clear. Moses goes up. He gets some words. He comes down and tells the people the words. Right? We get this issue later where Moses goes up to Sinai and God is telling him stuff. And then keeps telling him stuff. And keeps telling him stuff. And chapters and chapters and chapters go by. And we kind of forget, oh, this is just Moses in Sinai doing this. Right? It's not him interacting with the people or God telling the people this stuff. It happens for a long time where it's just God and Moses. Here, it's a very short statement, and Moses comes down and says, 
Moses came and called the elders of the people again and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And then in verse 8, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses comes back to God and says that. So Moses is very much the intermediary, the prophet. So he gets some words from God, he comes and tells them to the people, the people say that sounds good, and Moses comes back to God and says they agree. So he's interacting, he's forming the covenant between God and the people. Uh, the Lord says, Behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud, that people may hear when I speak to you, and may also believe you forever. Do the people hear the words of God? It says here in 19.9, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak to you, and may also believe you forever. What is it that the people are hearing? So, I think the people hear that God is speaking to Moses, they do not hear the words. I don't think the people hear the actual words that God is saying. I think they hear the thunder and lightning and storm and know that it's God's voice, but they can't make it out. Unless you're inside at the top of the mountain, inside the storm, you can't understand what God is actually saying. Does that make sense? Um, it, seems, it seems like there's this distinction. Uh, because it says things like this, the Lord will hear the Lord speaking. Uh, the people will hear the Lord speaking. But it does seem very much like Moses is always the intermediary. Moses is always in between to protect the people and like to shield them from like when they give the wrong answer, God doesn't strike out and kill them right now because Moses is always in between. Um, I'm also curious. So this is more of a promise. We talked about the other one being a threat. Don't make me um, do what I did to the Egyptians to you guys. Here is more of a promise. You will be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And then he says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These two things, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, well, I think we talk about these a lot. But let's talk about what they mean now. What does it mean that Israel is a kingdom of priests? Because it's technically not true, right? We establish a priesthood. You have to be a Levite, to be in the priesthood. You have to, period. Right? And so it's technically not true that they're all a kingdom of priests. So what does this mean? If it, it doesn't mean everybody, every single one of you can't be a priest. What does it mean? The, so what's coming into my mind is like they're all like a witness to like the nation. You know, like that's mm -hmm. why God like gives them the commandments and it's like it's like you're a separate nation. Like you're not like all the, these other people, like you're my friend. And so, you know, priests being like an example of that and of God and like of his holiness, mm -hmm. maybe in that sort of way. <laughs> what function do the Levites perform for Israel? They are in charge of the sacrificial system in order to make sure that the rest of the people are atoned for. They're in right relation to God. They're doing the right sacrifices. They're keeping up. They are continuing the covenant. It seems like this has the global idea in mind. That in the same way that Moses is the, the, the priest, or Aaron is the priest for all of Israel, in the same way that the Levites are the priests for the rest of Israel, Israel itself is supposed to be a kingdom of priests to the rest of the world. Right? The whole earth is God's, Israel is going to be the priests that minister to everyone else. Um, this is where we get like Abraham, God says, all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. Right? We very much interpret that as Jesus blessing everybody, the Gentiles too. It seems like that's part of what's going on here also, is that the Israelites are supposed to have a specific type of worship, a specific type of religious practice that endears them to other people. Right? And I think that's what fits in with holy nation. That they are supposed to be separated from everybody else, that they're supposed to look different from everybody else in order to draw people toward Yahweh, right? in order to bring people into the group. Uh, I think we tend to think that Gentiles couldn't become Jewish, they couldn't convert. I, I think we're, we're taught that a lot, but it's not exactly true. Like, it happens a lot. There's a court in 
the temple in Jerusalem for Gentiles. The Gentile court, aptly named. Um, a Gentile can convert, can, they can become a God-fearer in the time of Jesus. They can marry into the family once they believe the, the practices. They never really become Jewish, but their children are counted as Jewish. If a God-fearer marries an Israelite and they have children, the children are Israelites. Even if one of the parents is technically a pagan or technically a Gentile who's converted and isn't really Jewish, their children are, right? Um, and that can continue. So maybe it's supposed to be this, you know, beacon, light on a hill that draws people in and they don't live up to this, right? Because this is not always, this is not the case. We don't see this a lot. You see this with like Solomon, uh, you know, the, the queen of Sheba comes to him for advice because the way that he has structured the nation is appealing to outsiders. You don't see it a lot outside of, you know, the height of David and Solomon ruling in Jerusalem, right? Other than that, it's a lot of infighting. It's a lot of breaking the rules that God has set out for them. And so they never really get to this point of doing the thing that God has designed for them to do. Does that make sense? Right. When Solomon structures the nation, though, I mean, he does it completely against everything God has told the kings to do. I mean... They're not supposed to keep gold. They're not supposed to take wives from other nations. They're, you know, they're not supposed. Yeah. To, they're not supposed to build up. I mean, at the beginning of Solomon's reign, it's all good. He's good. Yeah. And, and I think we see that in the way that he interacts with people. That he starts off good yeah, and then declines. Off great. Yeah. Yes. But I think that is that is the mark. Is the end of David's rule and the beginning of Solomon's rule is kind of the peak of. Okay, so you're talking about history. the peak, not the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the, not the totality of either of them. Because David doesn't start off with the United Kingdom. Right. He, there are still tribes that he has to bring in to expand the borders and everything else. The height of David's kingdom and the, the, the end of David's kingdom and the, end, the beginning yeah. of Solomon's yeah. is the height of, is the biggest expansion that they have, it's the most territory, it's the most prosperous, and they're not indebted, they're not, um, they're not vassals to anybody else. And that ends pretty quickly after Saul, um, because of the stuff that you're talking yeah, about with we just Saul. Don't, like, I feel like we don't get to know, like, are they coming because of God's structure, or are they coming because of this really crazy wealth, and they're yeah. coming to pick up their check? Yeah. You know? Uh, we already read this part. Again, all the people are answering and agreeing to these words, specifically... If you obey my words, you will be my treasured possession. And people are like, cool, we're on board, we will obey whatever you tell us. They haven't gotten the words yet, so they don't really know what they're agreeing to. Right? We will see what they agree to in a minute. Um, now, this is, you know, the most famous part of Exodus, right? I guess the plagues, and then the Ten Commandments. So we've got the Ten Commandments. I think our book talks about the ways to parse them out. You know, you can separate them into these have to do with God and these have to do with people. Or uh, they had another way to do it that was... Well, they kind of said the Sabbath was kind of both. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure that the text is interested in parsing them out that way. Uh, I think the text is just giving us the rules. Um... We talked about this yesterday when I was teaching at the prison, and so since it's already on my mind, we'll go ahead and talk about it. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any like this. What? <laughs> like we all just look at him, like, just you just teach at prison? Us. What's that? Did you teach at prison? Yeah, uh, I teach at one of the prisons here in town. Oh. Cool. Um, and so we, we were going through Colossians, uh, and they talk about the... It's like the preeminence of Jesus passage. But we ended up talking about this anyway. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's on the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of blah, 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 blah. Okay? So the question is, why is it important for God that we don't make images of him? Right? In most other you know, indigenous religions, which is kind of what the Hebrew religion is, at least at this point. It's an indigenous religion, meaning it's local to the ethnic people there. Right? If you go to Sub-Saharan Africa and you go to a tribal group, they have an indigenous religion where it's not what we think of as a global religion that's for everybody of different ethnicities. It's for them. The God that they worship is their God, and it doesn't really matter what other people think or believe. Because their God made them, and they exist because their God is better than some other gods. If they go to war with another tribe, it's really a war between our God and their God. And whoever's God is stronger is going to win the war, right? So those are that's kind of what happens. Most indigenous religions have images. And it's not that they make this rock and call the rock God. It's that the rock represents something else, right? They've made this image, and the image somehow represents the spiritual reality that they believe in. And God is saying not to do that. Why is God saying not to do that? Because we're his image, but we're all encompassing. Like, it's every, it, it, I mean, if you say that humans are the image of God, I mean, an image limits, limits God in some way. Okay. If you say that all humanity is the image of God, then that can't apply that there's simply a place or a time that God is in control. Mm-hmm. That's good. Um, I I struggle with that because I don't. We're made in God's image, but I don't know that we have the image of God. We have the entire image of God in us. Well, right. The entire image of God is like way bigger than we can contain. Right. So who who does have the image of God? He does. And. Well, he's the only one that's holy. Holiness uh-huh. is the completeness of every other character of God. So if holiness Jesus. is the. <laughs> So in Colossians, this is why I bring it up. Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. For by him all things are created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things are created through him and for him. Uh, He goes on elsewhere to say, oh, right here in 19, in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Right? And elsewhere he says that... um, He's the exact representation, the exact image of God. So I'm of the belief that it's important to God that we don't make images of him because God has already made an image of himself in Jesus, right? That we don't need to form for ourselves out of physical matter things to represent God because God is going to, at this point, will in the future make out of physical matter the exact image of himself, which is Jesus, the, the Christ the as only, flesh, yeah. right? But Jesus is the only image ever that could be holy. Correct. And so it seems like from like a, a very, you know, post-Paul Christian perspective, that's why this is important. I'm sure there are other reasons. Um, but there are people who take that to the, to the extent of they won't watch The Chosen because it's an image of Jesus. And so they think, we don't, we don't want to do that. And I've talked to some people who say, like, yeah, well, I have a problem with, because I watch The Chosen a lot. And when I pray now, I picture whatever the guy's name is, the actor who plays Jesus in The Chosen. Right? What about any other picture? Right. But that's, but that's the point. So okay. iconoclasts will say, you shouldn't have any images of Jesus at all because that taints your worship when you go to worship and pray to God because now you're picturing something in your head that is not him. By definition, the pictures that we have are not Jesus, right? Um, whether it's like the like white Jesus with the blonde hair, like surfer Jesus, you know, or if it's like a you know historically accurate, like squat Jewish man with side curls, like it doesn't matter. However you picture it, that's not what you're supposed to be doing, right? Um, which is a problem for most of us because most of us picture something in our heads, and I think that might be part of the issue here is that we're not supposed to be picturing something in order to worship God. Does that make sense? So kind of like the not speaking the name of God? It's very similar, yes. 
um, because the name is supposed to uh, encapsulate the character, right? And so it's the same sort of thing of like, we have this idea in our head that if we have the image, if we can picture it, then we can understand it. And so we picture whoever it is, and that is the wrong way to approach God, supposedly. Go ahead. Well, would this still kind of be the same situation? Because like, after Jesus' life and through art history, wouldn't we be able to kind of, I mean, not like, serve for Jesus, but like yeah. whatever seems like historically accurate of Jesus, is that still in the same pretenses of like this is wrong even though there was a physical form and people saw that Yeah, and... I don't know because you think of like the apostles to their dying day, they picture Jesus mm -hmm. so they pray and they they're picturing the dude mm -hmm. right, and then we don't benefit from that at all, we, don't, we have no way to recognize that um well, and Isaiah's got to have referenced what he saw. Right. For and he sees something. Life. Right. Yeah. Um, I imagine that the argument would be when you go to pray and you are picturing Jesus, like John, who's picturing the real Jesus, his belief is inferior to those of us who don't see Jesus mm -hmm. and believe and don't have the image to picture. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what he says at the end of John with the with doubting times. Um, I imagine it would be something along those lines. But we also know for sure we don't know what Jesus looked like. Right? We, I think something came out on the History Channel or um, National Geographic or something that was like, this is what scholars think is a historically accurate picture of Jesus given this and this and this. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but I mean, not really. Like, right. We know some things, but not a lot. And, and no way to know like, oh, this is actually like where his cheekbones rested, like, who cares? Because that's not supposed to be the way that we think about it. He's supposed to be defined by his character and not his image. Good? So, like, Go ahead. Okay, so if we do have an image, is that like, what I'm getting from this conversation, yeah, you're, is that like a false idol? Like, us, us creating this, like, imagery of worshiping Jesus, but we don't really know what Jesus Right. But I'm not like. I think it, it depends on who you ask. So, okay. so strict iconoclasts <laughs> will say you shouldn't even have a you shouldn't even have a cross at all. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have it at the center of your church. You shouldn't have it on the steeple. You shouldn't have it on your on your wrist or your necklace because that's an image. And when you worship Jesus, you're picturing the image of the cross. Um, they would obviously particularly be upset by a crucifix which is a cross that has the body on it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Catholics use crucifixes. Um, am I using the right word, iconoclasts? Is that what you looked at? I don't know what that means. So it's people who are opposed to icons, yeah. images. Um, icons and images are kind of the same thing. Okay. But uh, they, they are strictly opposed to images of the divine. This is what Muslims do across the board. Muslims do not have any images of God. They don't even have any images of Muhammad. If you look at ancient pictures depicting stuff in the events of the Quran, you can see all the people, um, but Muhammad is a body without a face. His face is just white. Like, it, like it's a white oval where the face should be. Because they believe that, they believe so much in not having an image of God, and Muhammad was so close to God, they won't even give the image of him. Because his face was so shaped by his interactions with uh, with Allah. Did, I was going to say, but they give him a name. Sort of. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, uh, yeah, but that's, okay. yeah, that's part of it, yeah. Um, if you're familiar with, and this is way off track, uh, um, if you're familiar with like South Park, South Park got into a huge issue because they were trying to have an episode that depicted Muhammad. They, they wanted to draw Muhammad's face in the picture, and they got in huge trouble for it. Um, I don't remember if the episode ever aired or not. I, I, I don't remember the rest of the story. But it was a huge issue because of that. And that comes back to what we're talking about with graven images. Because they believe so strictly against it. I don't think any of us believe that strictly against it, right? Um, particularly when you have Catholicism and, and different kinds of Orthodox groups that have images for everything, right? You can get, like, cards 
that are laminated for every saint in the world, right? Um, they have images of Jesus. They People hang them on their mantles. There's that joke of, like, the picture of Obi-Wan Kenobi that's on Grey Hall's mantle, and she thinks yeah. that it's Jesus. Um, but then the communion cup becomes an idol. It becomes illegal as well, and uh-huh. Jesus says do it. So. Uh-huh. I, I think a lot of it comes to how we interpret what this means and sticking to it, right? Our book took some time talking about the, sec- the third one, uh, Taking God's Name in Vain. I found this very interesting. Are you, you guys, I read this yesterday, so it's fresh in my brain. Yeah, no, it was interesting. So yeah. the argument is taking the Lord's name in vain does not mean um, using God's name as an expletive when you stub your toe. Or uh, using God's name blasphemously when you're lying about something, or or anything along those lines. What what the the text pointed out was taking means not just using but carrying. And so the argument was taking the Lord's name in vain is taking the Lord's name upon yourself and then it not meaning anything and it being empty. So. The, the idea, and I think that fits very well with us, with our with our terminology, is the idea of like kind of what a lot of Americans do, of like saying that you're a Christian and it not meaning anything in your life. That is, they argue, that is the definition of taking the Lord's name in vain, is claiming the Lord's name upon yourself and then it being empty, it being meaningless. Taking the Lord's name in vain, right? Kind of the ultimate misrepresentation. Yeah. Right. Um, I found that a very compelling, and that and that helped me because taking the Lord's name in vain seems like a very strict, like, oh, don't say these words, and instead of saying, oh my God, you could say, oh my goodness, or oh my gosh, and then you're okay, and then everything is fine. It's like, eh, but I know what you mean, right? Um, and people do this a lot, when like, instead of using this name as an expletive, you're using this other thing as an expletive. Um, it's like, I know what, exactly what you mean, though. Like, when you say, gosh darn it, I know exactly what you mean. So it seems like you're still doing the same thing, and you're just kind of getting around the rule, right? But this idea of taking the Lord's name in vain, meaning taking the name upon yourself and it not meaning anything in your life, I found that very compelling. Yeah. That that kind of expands the rule to be more of a heart issue than following these legalistic rules. It I, found it, I found it very compelling. Yeah, no, it made a lot of sense. Uh, any other thoughts on any of these? I feel like a lot of these make sense. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. They make sense. We're all pretty used to them. Um, let's keep moving. Is, let's talk about... Or ahead. for no false witness, is mm-hmm. that like... I looked at it, but it's like making someone seem um, guilty when they're innocent. Yeah, so I think we apply it to lying in general, but I think specifically it means um, what we would call perjury. So being used as a witness and lying in your testimony about somebody else, bearing false witness. So I think we would view it much more in in the legal sense of perjury, getting on the stand and swearing an oath on the Bible and then lying about your testimony. I think that's like the technical sense here, but we expand that to pretty much mean any lying. Um, particularly lying about another person, saying that they did something that they didn't, or saying they didn't do something when they did, or whatever the case is, right? It's like the lower form of blasphemy. Blasphemy is lying about God, his activities. False witness is lying about other people and their activities. Well, if you take number three, like we just talked about, then number nine becomes much more important. Right. Um, um, Which one? False witness? Number nine, yeah. Okay. I think, I think it's much more interpersonal. Uh, because I think uh, saying that you heard from the Lord when you didn't would fall into this. Would be uh, attributing things to God that aren't his. What we would call it blasphemy. Um, saying, oh, God spoke to me and he didn't. I think false witness is, in the way that it's described... Uh, because it says don't bear false witness against your neighbor. And I think they flesh out the idea elsewhere in another law of you can't, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, somebody killed Joe down the street. Where was your neighbor last night? 
you could say, oh, I saw him walking towards Joe's house at 11. Or you could say, I don't know. Right? But if you are lying, you're bearing false witness against that person. Right? I think that's what it's talking about is in order, and this is probably in order to construct a, a, a society for them, a civilized society where they all follow the rules. This is saying, hey, you can't lie about each other or else God will get you. Right? So God is saying we need to be truthful in the way we interact with each other so that we can have order. So that when we bring complaints to the judges, the judges know who to trust. Because we have serious repercussions for those. That seems to be the I mean, that makes sense. I think in, like, chapter 23 or 24, it's, like, talks about legal matters of, like, yeah. everybody is fair, all that with the judge. Well, and, and God had rewarded the lie with the midwives and Pharaoh. Uh huh. So then he has to. I mean, he he rewarded them for doing that. So then yep. he's got to come back and say, well, now that was over there, and this is over. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We we will continue to talk about like there are these laws, but there's also people who are not following the laws, and nothing happens to them. Right. That's we'll get into which sort of stuff. Seem to operate outside of them sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we're just coming off of God just killed a whole bunch of people, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the end of them leaving Egypt. Right. It's like they leave because God killed a bunch of people. So then how do we square that with like, oh, by the way, you shouldn't kill people. And then you're about to kill 3,000 people because of the <coughs> golden path. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about this real quick. Uh, I know that we have talked about this in previous classes, but there's a bunch of rules here in 21. Um when you buy a Hebrew slave, he'll serve six years, and then there's the year of jubilee, right? You're familiar with this. The seventh year of the slaves go free. Um, if he comes out single, he leaves single. If he comes in married, he leaves married. If he comes in and marries someone else and has a kid, then the wife and the kid belong to the master, and he leaves with nothing, which seems very much against, like, you're married for life, right? I mean, this seems very strange with, like, our understanding of what the Bible says about marriage. Um, the person can also come and so, come to his master in verse seven and say, oh, no, 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 no. "Isn't it like if he came uh, with a wife, he keeps it, but if he got the wife, probably the right. slave." The, the idea is if the master it. gets the wife for him, he doesn't yeah. get to keep his wife. Right. But then that goes against like you're married and right. to death do us part. Yeah. Except when the master decides not to. Not to. Yeah. The master can also agree with the slave. He can say, "I love the slave." Can say, "I love my master, my wife, my children. I don't want to leave." Mm -hmm. And then the the master can mark him permanently as a slave for life. It's important for us to remember this is very much talking about like indentured servitude, people who sell themselves into slavery in order to get out of debt or to arrange themselves in society at a certain point. Um, but I mean, this also has issues with it. Uh, if you look at seven, a man can sell his daughter as a slave. Um, and there's a whole set of rules about what that looks like with the negotiations between the father and the master. This is a this is problematic. We'll get into it in a second. Um, then you also have in 16, whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. This seems to be one of the main arguments that pops up in like the abolition movements, trying to end slavery. And so like if you think of Civil War, the Northerners who are trying to fight against slavery, the Christian argument comes from here. That we're not talking about people who sell themselves willingly into slavery. We're talking about people who are kidnapped. And kidnapping is ex explicitly rejected, even in the Old Testament. And that's what we've done. Um, so their argument is, we've kidnapped these people from Africa. They didn't come willingly. And therefore, the whole trade is scuttled. It's not right. Um, that's, this is the argument that starts that movement that comes from like northern Christian abolitionists. Um, we have so many rules that are so strange and so specific. Uh, let's talk about another one that I'm sure a lot of us have heard before in 21. Uh, there's a story, a, a hypothetical. If two men are striving together and they hit a pregnant woman so that her child comes out and there's no harm, the one who hit her shall be fined, as the, the wife's, the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. 
But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. We're familiar with this. We've seen this used before, like in contemporary society. I've got a little footnote on mine for verse 3. And it says, uh, actually it's not verse 3, it's verse um, 23. They translate it differently in the footnote. And it says, so that her children come out, and it's clear who was to blame. He shall be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay the fine. But if it's unclear who to, is to blame, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Very kind of different meaning because it's implying the blame there. So my point of bringing this up is this is a, a key tech that folks use in like the pro-life arguments. You know what I'm talking about? To say that um, to say that babies in the womb are babies and they're considered lives. And so if in this instance we generally interpret this as if two men are fighting, they hit a pregnant woman, and she miscarries, and the baby dies, then the person who hit her should be killed. Are we familiar with this? Have we all heard this before? Um, I don't know that that's what the text is saying, or if that's what we want the text to be saying. Uh, most of the like Jewish interpreters that I've read of this are talking about the harm done to the mother. Like, if she is struck and gives birth early, that's a traumatizing thing for her. And so if she dies in childbirth because of this conflict between these two men, then the men are at fault. But if she gives birth and everything's okay, then it's fine. Um, the commentaries that I've seen, uh, at least from like the Jewish perspective, don't necessarily say that the, uh, when it says, but if there is no harm, they don't necessarily indicate that it's chiefly concerned with the harm of the baby. Does that make sense? They also point to, there's the passages that talk about, like, if a woman is accused of adultery, she has to drink from this bitter think, water, yeah. right? I think the, the, the priest takes and ashes yeah. and pours it into some water, mixes it up, and she has to drink, and then what does it say it does? It, like, it, shrivels her womb yeah. if she's guilty. She's guilty. Yeah. Again, like the, the, the Jewish commentaries describe that as... Um, I mean, they describe it as forcing a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the bitter water, whatever it is, if she did have an affair mm -hmm. and is pregnant by that affair, drinking the bitter water aborts the baby. Mm -hmm. That's the argument. Mm -hmm. um, and so they'll point to this text and they'll point to that text and say, we don't really think that these texts have anything to do with like the baby in the womb having life or like being the concern here. They would say the concern is whether or not she had an affair. And the concern here is whether or not she is harmed, whether or not the trauma done to her kills her. Right? Does that make sense? Um, I'm not saying that, like, we shouldn't be pro-life. I'm saying these are the texts that we point to, and I'm not sure that that's what they mean. I think there are better texts that we could point to, right? Uh, the one that I always look at is, like, Jesus, uh, Mary comes to visit Elizabeth, uh, and the baby in Elizabeth's womb senses the baby in Mary's womb and, like, leaps for joy in her womb, right? That seems much more of a, of a solid argument that, like, whatever it is in Elizabeth's womb is capable of, like, I mean, stuff that we're not capable of, right? right. Sensing that the divine is near and experiencing joy because of it. Well, responding to God. Right. And, and like, I've got kids. I don't... My... my you know, if I had a two-month-old baby, leaping for joy is not something they do, right? So, like, John doing this in the womb seems miraculous, but it also seems like something a human does, not something a, a non-person lump of cells does, right? That seems like a much more clear argument than this. This seems very vague, particularly because of, like, the vagueness of the Hebrew that they're using. Does this make sense? I don't want to sound like a heretic, but this is a text that comes up a lot, and... I'm just not sure that this is the best text for us to point to. Yeah. Yeah. Is that kosher? I don't know if you guys are mad at me. Or no, that's a, I mean, um, it's like, you, you throw your argument out there, and you, and then everybody questions, and you go, oh, okay, he makes a point. You know, maybe this is a better text. Yeah. Well, um, and, and I think, like, I've seen it's been, like, in studies in, like, Deuteronomy, where, like, the woman, like, if, if like, she's taken advantage of, like, yeah. she's, if she's raped, like, that that person is supposed to take her. And so, like, it's like, oh, my God, 
gosh, that seems crazy. And, right. and just like this, like mm-hmm. this seems crazy, but it's it's ultimately to pr- protect the woman. Like, hey, this is this is written here like this, so mm-hmm. that the men would recognize that and be like, oh, like because this woman is is it's something different. It's well now I, my life is at stake, so probably shouldn't. Right, it, 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 assault, a woman, yeah. and probably, especially a pregnant woman, because this is the outcome. Same thing with like, right? You well, know, and, and in a society where women are considered less than, mm-hmm. oh, maybe if I'm going to get really angry with him, I should, we should take it out back, right? You know, as opposed to right here with these right. women and children. You know? And it also seems like a lot of it is a lot of these laws are designed to limit retribution. Mm-hmm. I think we've talked about this before, where mm-hmm. before um, this is a big like contradiction that people like to point out in the Bible of Jesus comes along and says, mm-hmm. you've heard eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I tell you don't do that. Yeah. Right? Um, so it seems like before uh, it's very much like anything goes. Right? So the idea is like if, if you come and cut my hand off, I will kill you and your whole family. Right? And so what the what the Torah comes and does is says an eye for an eye or a life for a life. Uh, like a spell. Um, and you see how this is a limitation. Right? Before, um, if you kill my brother, I will wipe out your family so you don't have any more sons. Right? And now, the law is if you kill someone, you are killed. No more. The retribution can't be greater than the crime, right? If you strike your slave and they lose an eye, there's there's a repercussion for that in the law. And then Jesus comes along and limits it further and says, I mean, it seems like it's no retribution, right? But it's not that he is um, contradicting this. It's that it's further limitation, right? So here... This is the gambit of the stuff you're allowed to do in retribution. Now, you can only do this much stuff. And now, you can't do anything. Right? It's further limiting. So it's not a contradiction. It's a a further clarification of the rules. But it also parallels their understa- our understanding of God. What do you mean? I mean, under anything goes, there is no understanding of God. Uh-huh. Under the Torah, there's a partial understanding of Jesus. And his, you know, there's a partial understanding and under Jesus. Uh, let's look at this. If I can pull it up. Because kind of what Ashley was talking about. There's just a lot of um, like wonky stuff. Yeah. Right? And it's all right next to each other. Mm-hmm. So so here's the example that I that I looked at in just like two or three chapters. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you can sell your daughters and there's regulations for that. Um, if you hit your parents, you will be killed by the people. Right? Um, I'm assuming that hitting the parents is like once you're over the age of responsibility. Yes, but this directly goes against this. Not right? a two-year-old that comes uh, and goes, no! Right, <laughs> but, but I think that's that's the idea. Is like me as a 30-something-year-old, if I go and hit my dad because we get into a fight, I will be killed by the people, mm-hmm. right? Which kind of goes against this. Um, but these are rules here. Uh, no witches are allowed to live, but witch wanders in, kill her. We loved this in like the yeah. 17th century. But then like at the same time, this is like three verses later, care for the sojourners because you were sojourners in Egypt and care for the widows and the orphans. And if you don't, I will make your children and your wives widows and orphans, right? I mean, this is a very different kind of rule, right? Don't lie about other people. This is kind of what we were talking about with the expansion of the bearing false witness. And it's difficult because they're all over the place. They're all right next to each other. And some of them we think are nonsense, and some of them are like, oh, we should still be doing that today, right? I mean, we talk about like caring for sojourners. This is something that we should still be doing today, right? Like foreigners and immigrants that are living among us, we should be caring for these people. We should not be lying to others about stuff. I imagine that if I met a witch, I would not immediately try to kill her, right? Like as a difference of opinion, even though this verse very clearly tells me that a witch should not be allowed to live. What do we do with that? Um, This is what we talked about in previous classes, but this all goes back to we need to have a way to navigate these sorts of laws 
without appearing hypocritical. Because this is 100% what happens, that we appear hypocritical. Because we use these same sort of laws, we'll get into Leviticus next week, to say, like, I mean, the, the classic example that people point out all the time is homosexuality. And they will say, well, if you are prohibiting homosexuality because of Leviticus 19, you should be able to sell your daughters for a certain price. Because the law says you can. Or you should be killed if you hit your parent or anything else. We need to have some sort of system in order to navigate these sorts of rules. And what's difficult is, especially here in Exodus, there is no distinction of like, oh, these are moral laws, or these are case laws, or these are universal laws, or these are like laws of the state. It's all wrapped together. And there's no clear navigation system. Does that make sense? Would you not say that the New Testament would, would, I mean, the New Testament strictly, you know, clearly prohibits homosexuality. It, you know, it's not prohibit. I mean, it's kind of, you know, Jesus has brought this new covenant and it isn't really talking about hitting parents and selling daughters because you're, you're, you know, the Holy Spirit is supposed to teach you better. But it sounds like what you're saying is some of the laws don't matter because Jesus comes. No, I just say if they're repeated in the New Testament. So any law that's not repeated is excluded? You would kind of say, well, we know where... I mean, it says specifically care for widows and orphans. It says not to lie in the, in the New Testament. I mean, mm-hmm. it. the other ones, you would kind of go, well, we know that's wrong. Like... Right, but that's the problem is if we just bank on we know that's wrong, then other people can say, I don't know that that's wrong. Right? Somebody else can come along and say, I don't know that homosexuality is wrong. I, it doesn't appear to be wrong. You're just telling me that it is because it's this in this rule in Leviticus. So us being able to bank on like, oh, well, we all know the moral rules, that doesn't really work in, in our kind of vastly humanist society where it's not hurting anybody. That's the argument is – as long as you're not hurting anybody, as long as I'm not affecting the humanity of somebody else, then it doesn't matter. Racism hurts people. Homosexuality doesn't, is what they is what they will argue. And so they'll say, it doesn't appear to me to be wrong. Therefore, how do we navigate those sorts of things? What you suggested might be a viable methodology, but then it runs the risk of, well, why do we need the Old Testament at all? If we're only looking at the laws that are repeated yeah. in the New Testament... Then we don't need any of this. We just need to read this, and this will give us the laws because anything that's in here but not in here, we just said we're excluded. So then we don't need this anymore. Well, right? We need all of it. I mean, we need that anything goes to say, okay, God brought you to here, and now you know Jesus says, well, Moses allowed this for the hardness of your heart, but now I say this. So there is this. I mean, it's a refining of mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. I bring this up not to offer answers. So no, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> but, I, I'm not saying I have that answer. But to point this in front of all of us it. as this is a very real issue that when we interact with people, this comes up all the time. Um, I, I was in seminary for a while. When I interact with people, that comes up, right? So if I'm on a plane by myself and talking to the person next to me, it kind of comes up. And most people who don't really interact with the church at all, the second they find out, like, oh, I'm, I go to church or I have a degree or whatever it is, they have questions. And this is almost always the stuff that they're interested in. It's like, how, what do Christians think about this stuff? I hear stuff because I see the news, and I hear that some people believe this and some people think it's silly. Tell me about it. Right? This stuff pops up all the time with like normal people who are not in, who don't come to church on Sunday, who haven't spent time developing and thinking about this. It comes up all the time. And so I think it's our job to be able to approach it and say, and, and, and give a reasonable explanation of, no, I'm actually not going to come up with a price to sell my kid to somebody else. Right? That seems wrong. Right? But to actually be able to say why I'm not on board with that, but I am on board with other stuff. Right? Uh, after the Decalogue, after these laws, we get the same sort of thing. Moses comes to the people, tells them all the words the Lord said. The people answered with one voice and say, all the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. 
So they've gotten some, before they agreed and didn't know what they were agreeing to. Now they've gotten some of the rules and they're say, they say, cool, we're on board, we're gonna agree. This will um, come back to bite them. Uh, another interesting thing, we've talked about this before, particularly with like Moses writing down the Torah, the Torah coming from Moses. He wrote something, right? It tells us here, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. No idea what this means. They call it the Book of the Covenant. It seems like this is specifically these passages in like Exodus 20 to 23 uh, up until, yeah, the end of 23. And then Moses wrote it down somehow. This is separate from the 10, like the tablets. Somehow it's written down, somehow it's preserved. This seems to be like the beginning of fragments of things that are eventually collated into the book of Exodus or the book of Leviticus or whatever it is. That Moses is writing something, but it's not necessarily that he's writing this. Does that make sense? Uh, the same way that we have like Luke who goes around and collects eyewitness testimony from different people and collates it together into one form. Seems like this is the beginning of that process. Good? Uh, I know we only have five minutes left. Maybe <laughs> are way behind. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is what I was talking about. This is the end of like the Sinai, the first Sinai episode. His assistant Joshua here. Mm -hmm. Moses rose with Joshua, but then Joshua drops out completely. But it seems to imply that like when you see the name Moses, you assume Joshua was there. Moses went up into the mountain. He said to the elders, "Wait here for." Us, Joshua, with him, right? And so we return. Moses went up to the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord, uh, this is supposed to be dwelt on Sinai. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses. And now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain. This is something that people see, right? The fire on the top of the mountain. Moses entered the cloud and went up onto the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Where is Joshua? Well, Joshua waited at the entrance of the tent, right? Joshua lived in the tent. But I mean, didn't he, when Moses was in speaking with the Lord, wasn't he keeping the door? I don't know. I think okay. Joshua's inside. I think because particularly in the tent. This is the same thing. Like, Joshua's learning his job. Because like, there's, a, there's an instance where Moses leaves, and it says, and Joshua remained in the tent. So, like, mm -hmm. Moses is there meeting with God, and Joshua is there. Moses leaves, and Joshua stays. It implies Joshua stayed with God. Nothing in here indicates to me that Joshua dropped off at some point. That he's like, you know, there's all these different, Moses went up to here, and then he went up to here, and then he went up to here. There's nothing to me that indicates that like, oh, Moses entered the cloud, but Joshua stayed right outside. I don't really see we don't that. Get to know. We don't really know. No. It seems like Joshua's on board with all of this. That Joshua's there, learning and growing. Well, and there's clearly this preparation. Yes, I mean, and that is very much... Um, that happens in, in ancient worlds and medieval cultures where the assistant, the page, the, the person who's like the up-and-comer is privy to stuff they frankly should not be privy to. They are in like, uh, our example would be like the president going into um, the situation room and bringing with him his... Intern from somewhere. Yeah. Right. Um, except in, in, our, in our culture, in our, it would be like the vice president, right? But for this, it's like the intern, who is gonna eventually become the president somehow. That doesn't work in our system. But the intern has no business being in the situation room. They're not going to participate at all, but they are there, and they're learning and taking notes. And but that seems have, like what Joshua is doing. You have the idea of apprenticeship where it is like you're not going anywhere. Uh -huh. I mean, we do kind of consider the intern as like, okay, you're here from Columbia University to serve your semester, and then you're going on. You know, apprenticeship is more like you're taking over the shop, so you might know more of the, like, the books. Right. Uh, one more thing here. When we, when we read the New Testament, Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. You know what I'm talking about? The very beginning yeah. uh, of the ministry. Satan comes 40 days and 40 nights, right? We, most commentaries, most past, like, most sermons we hear about that almost always equate that to the 40 years that Israel wandered in the desert. I have no idea why. Yeah. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. It seems like a very clear connection 
Moses goes up and meets with God for 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know why we don't, when we see Jesus went to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, I don't know why we don't connect it to this. When Moses goes and meets with God. And now Jesus is going and instead of meeting with God, he's combating Satan as God. Right? It seems like this is what we're supposed to be thinking of in the in the New Testament text about like the temptation and everything. That's just my take on it. Uh, we haven't covered the tabernacle at all. Uh, we have one minute left. Uh, it happens. All of 25 to 31 is this vision that Moses receives of the tabernacle at the top of the mountain. He Some of it is spoken and some of it is, is he's picturing it. He's seeing it. I don't know if that means that there's a tabernacle in heaven that exists and then Moses is commissioned to make it on earth, right? And earth is it is in heaven. Again, talking about like the Lord's Prayer kind of thing. Some people think that it is, that there is in heaven a tabernacle and Moses was commissioned to make one just like it. I don't know. That seems a little strange to me. But we get all these rules and all this stuff that we're supposed to make. The ark and the table and the lampstand and the, gold, the bronze altar and the altar of incense, the lamps and oils and curtains and the clothes and all this stuff. Moses gets all the vision of it. And then what does Moses do? He makes it. Right? So he gets six chapters of explanation. And then we have the whole incident with the golden calf and all this stuff. And then we get more chapters of him making it. And it's very repetitive. And I think the re repetition is a purpose to say Moses is doing exactly what God told him to do. The specifications that he received up here, he's laying out the specifications down here. For us, it's very repetitive. I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to say boring, but like, it seems very, it seems repetitive to the point of boredom. But I think that's the point, that Moses is doing it exactly like he was prescribed to do it, like God commissioned him to do it. Well, I have, have look at the one second, because I know we're, we're running out of time. Um, we, I guess we'll talk about the golden calf next time. Um, but I want to point out one more thing before we go. <coughs> this is the beginning of 31. Um, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with this story and where I'm going. Uh, there's these two guys, uh, Bezalo and Aholia. Very fun names. Look at what God says here. God says, I've called Bezalel. I've filled him with the spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work with gold and silver and bronze, cutting stones and settings, and carving wood, and to work in every craft. This guy is filled with the Holy Spirit in order to do this kind of like very mechanical craft thing, right? Um, we don't think in these terms at all, right? But this seems very much like in our, in our vernacular, it could be like filled with the Spirit of God with ability and intelligence to be an auto mechanic, right? To do these things that are otherwise mundane, and God is going to use these things for his specific purposes, right? I think this can be a very helpful framework for us to think about, like, vocational callings outside of ministry, right? That you can be called vocationally to do something outside of, like, being a street preacher or being a missionary in Africa or whatever it is, being a pastor or whatever. That these people are filled with the Spirit of God, which means they've been doing this for years before they ever use it, like, to actually build the temple. And they have, you know, carving wood. Right? They are so skilled with carving wood that God says that it comes from God that they're doing this. A very mundane kind of physical, mechanical thing. I don't know that we think in these terms a lot. I find this very interesting. I find this very helpful in talking with people about their vocational calling, what they're going to do with their lives, and this sort of stuff. Anything, cutting stones and setting, this seems like jewelry. Jewelry crafting is part of being filled with the Spirit of God. Right? Go ahead. Maybe. We, we certainly never get the idea of, like, Jesus' carpentry was devoted to God, right? We never really get that. But it seems like, um, it seems like in the same way that God sets apart Moses and Aaron for their jobs, he has set apart these guys for this job. And, and we could say, like, oh, well, that's because he was going to use them for a specific purpose of building the tabernacle. But they do this for years before they ever built the tabernacle. It's not like they were fishermen, and then today the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they're good at all this stuff. They very clearly have worked on it for years. 
I find that helpful, uh, particularly with, with interacting with people. We are over time, and I know it's time to go to chapel. So we will pick up on the rest of the construction of the tabernacle. We'll talk about the golden calf, and then we'll get into Leviticus and Numbers uh, on Thursday. Okay? So turn in whatever stuff.